Please welcome back Julianne Nicholson and Zoe Ziegler. And Annie Baker. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. Um, Julianne and Zoe, you just saw the film for the first time. I don't want to put you on the With spot. With 900 but. of our closest <laughs> friends. <laughs> It certainly felt that way, but you, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you want to share any? <laughs> you know what? I loved it. Okay. I, I felt like I usually hate watching myself, and it's very hard, especially with people and like blood rushes in my ears, and I can't really take in the story. But I felt like we made, like the, that's the movie that we were making, and I loved watching it with you all. Zoe. I loved it. <laughs> you should. You're both amazing in it, so thanks for being here. Um, Annie, I just wanted to start by asking you, we've known your, your plays for, I think, over a decade. At what point did you want to make a film? Um, well, oddly, there, oddly, there's a Word document on a computer I had when I was 19 or 20 um, in college titled Janet Planet, and it was kind of the first idea for a movie I ever had. Um, and it sat dormant for 20 years. Uh, and I think I recently I found some like very early dialogue that's not in the movie, but it's a mother and a daughter sitting on a porch talking, and it's very much these two characters. So, so yeah, it lived with me for a really long time. You know, I've written a lot of screenplays for hire over the years. It's how I got health insurance for many years. Um, but I had never actually set out to write a film for myself to direct. And so when I realized I wanted to do that, I went back to this. It, it was, yeah, it, it was like a film that had lived inside of me for a really long time. Um, but I've always wanted to direct a film. It was kind of the first thing I wanted to do when I was a little girl. There were a lot of reasons that I thought probably wasn't a good idea to try. Yeah. Um, one thing that strikes me about this film is, you know, we see a lot of fil um, films about childhood or, you know, this, this coming of age, adolescence. Um, this cusp moment in cinema is, is kind of a very popular subject. Um, and I feel like your film resists a lot of the conventions of films that deal with childhood experience. I'm wondering how conscious that was um, in conceptualizing the film. Yeah, well, you know how you have a idea for a project or a thing that just feels very true to you, and then you, and then there was a point at which I realized with a sinking feeling how many, <laughs> you know, how many coming of age stories about 10 to 12 year olds there are out there. And then you just kind of have to close your eyes and keep going. I mean, and there are so many amazing ones that influence the movie a lot. I think something that occurred to me early on, especially dealing with a girl, was that I didn't want it to be about the onset of puberty, um, boys, uh, being seen that way by the world. I felt like so many coming of age stories about girls were about sexuality, which is obviously a totally fascinating subject, but it, I wanted to capture something else about a kind of intellectual, spiritual development happening for a little girl that I'd actually seen in a lot of movies about boys. Amazing, amazing movies about boys, like I'm thinking movie, Kiarostami movies or PLA movies, just these amazing movies about where you kind of feel a child's brain and way of seeing the world changing over the course of a movie. Um, and then I also really wanted to deal um, with this idea of the mother as love object, sort of for your first 12 years, or I, and not for everybody, but I feel like for a lot of us, our moms are like, I don't know, I, I, I always think of like, I remember when I was writing it, I thought of Jean Moreau and Jules and Jim, but like, what if it was your mom? And you, you kind of had like your relationship to that love and beauty object changed over the course of the movie. But it's a, it's a, yeah, it's lovers and it's a marriage, but it's a, 
parent and a child. And, th and that I felt like w was a thing I really wanted to bring to it. Yeah. So you said in, in the introduction that the two of you grew up in Western Massachusetts, which you did not know uh, until when? Until we met. It, it, was, it was Julianne's the only person I met for the role, and I didn't know. It, w it was like within 10 minutes of sitting down, we were like, where are you from? How? Oh, really? Where? Yeah, like we s it <coughs> truly shopped at the same stores and swam in the same ponds. And you grew up, I was more in town, and you were more outside of town. Uh, yeah, from, I, from 7 to 11, I was... I grew up first outside of Boston, then my mom and my stepfather, he moved from Maine, we moved from Boston to this little cabin in the woods in Western Mass with no electricity or running water. And that's where I lived from seven to 11, which is basically down the road from where, where we filmed. And it's such a particular part of the world, part of the state. And I just thought Annie did such a brilliant job capturing that. And it hasn't changed. I mean, it's kind of the same now. <laughs> And, and Julian was very much part of, you know, we had a really long production design daydreaming process with our amazing production designer. And Julian and I would also text and we like specific lotions or we're both really sad. This diaphragm our production designer found didn't end up in the movie. Yeah, I told she, Annie that um, my, I, I would sometimes. We both remembered our mother's diaphragms yeah. like drying on a shelf. <laughs> um, and our production designer found one. And we just yeah. didn't, it's there, but you just can't see it. Yeah. But you really, I, I feel like there was so much, um, I, I see watching the movie so much reminiscing sort of you and me and Teresa, our production designer, all kind of objects from all three of us making their way into Definitely. The that was yeah. that was such a lovely part of it, to be able to f contribute in that way. And I had all these pictures of my mom and my half-brothers and sisters, which were... They were that eight, they were Lacey's age in 1991, so it was it was a real going back in time. Yeah, a lot of your me. photos were used for the costume research too. Yeah, I'm curious about um, Julianne how you approach the character. Um, you know, it's a film that takes place over a relatively short period of time, but I'm wondering how was it important for you to think about who the character was beyond what we see, and I don't know if it was important for you as well, Annie. Um, I. I I, I, so much of it was there on the page, and then Annie and I talked regularly for the year leading up to filming. And also, as I said, my mom. My, mo I, my mom was a single mom of two young daughters in the late 70s for a couple of years, and so I, had, I have real memories of being a, a little threesome. Um, and then also women that were in her life. I mean, I, literally, we went contra dancing. This is so close to my young life that it's kind of kind of scary. So there was a lot there already, and then imagination and Annie and lovely Zoe. Zoe. Um, so Annie, you said you found Zoe at the very end of the casting process. If I look back, I almost have have a panic attack because it actually was very, it, it, I was looking for like a year or more than a year. And I think we met you Zoe like a month or two before prep started, which like, if I think about it is very upsetting, but our, exe our, our executive producer, Rose Garnett, I would call her in a panic every once in a while. And she would say, it's like, she's out there and you're going to find her. And, um, it was quite harrowing. And I still sometimes will walk by an introverted looking 11 year old on the street and be like, maybe I should talk to her and <laughs> she could be, and, and I still have the impulse because I still, it, it was, I was really stopping girls on the street and in Whole Foods and giving them my number and we had like four casting directors on the job and e-blasting and it was quite desperate and, and um, it was pretty um, amazing to meet you for the first time and, and I'll never forget it and then, and then you came into town and the two of them read together. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason, I mean, Zoe's so amazing in so many obvious ways, but it, it was one of those auditions where afterwards I just couldn't picture the movie with anybody else. You know, you just sort of can't. I would be talking about it with my production designer and my cinematographer, and I, I always realized I was picturing Zoe, and then I you sort of can't go back after that. Yeah. So, wait, do you remember the first meeting? Yeah. Yeah, I do. 
<laughs> Were you scared? Not really. What made you, now I'm just asking so many questions. What made you interested in doing a movie? Well, mom has a small private school and her, one of the, the, one of the parents from there, she, her daughter's an actor and she thought that we'd be, I would be perfect for it, so. It was like a description we had sent out? Yeah. <laughs> so, Julian, you were saying that this is very close to, you know, certain experiences and memories that you had. Um, Annie, I'm wondering if that was important for you, I mean, to go back to, you know, your hometown um, and to a period of time that where you were this age. Like, I'm, if you can say a little bit more about what, what you were drawing on for your first film. Yeah, a lot of it was about a sense of place. And, you know, there's always a point when you're putting the film together and doing the budget and things are really tight and scary when the topic is raised of how much cheaper it would be to film it within an hour and a half's driving distance of New York City. And um, the producers and I had to really like check in about whether it was indeed paramount to shoot it in Western Massachusetts. And the answer was yes. And we all went forward and made it work, which was so great. Because there was a point at which, you know, you get scared the movie won't happen because you're kind of insisting on something. Um, but it, it, yeah, I'm, the, that land and those people are so important to me and all our extras are local people and we worked with this amazing theater company in Ashfield called the Double Edge Theater Company and a lot of their actors are in it and, and, and some of that work is from their pieces and um, it just, I can't imagine shooting it in, um, you know, Mamaroneck. It's really, <laughs> it wouldn't quite work. And, um, in terms of drawing from my own personal experience, you know, I, it, 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 it is, it's one of the things I like so much about writing. It starts really personal, and then the more time passes, the more it feels like it sort of has nothing to do with you uh, in such a great way, and then you just sort of have fun taking things from your life. You know, there are blankets from my mom, and a lot of those little creatures I made when I was a kid and you know there's a lot of stuff from my house and my life but also a lot of stuff from everybody you know from Zoe you know there's like we put a lot of horses everywhere because Zoe likes horses and there's like lotion Julianne used when she was a kid and it really did be become all of us and um, I was telling my mother this yesterday but it's true I, I equally identify with every character in the movie it, it, they sort of all become you and then they also just become the actors. Yeah. You said in your introduction that these two actors taught you how to direct a movie. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, a lot of people taught. Me. I'm st I, I'm still figuring out how to direct a movie, but I feel like I kind of might understand now. <laughs> finally, sitting here in front of you guys. Um, uh, but you know, one thing Julian and Zoe taught me that you just don't have in the theater that I I love so much is is like this sense of throwing stuff at the wall and not having to decide what sticks until much later. Um, in theater, you really like all have to sit around a table and at some point, even if it's in week four of rehearsals, like come to a decision about what the character choice is and what exactly is happening in that moment. And sometimes I feel like that can be kind of over-articulated and over-determined and these two people were so smart and so open to discussion, but also like, you know, a lot of the takes in the movie are their first take before we'd even talked about it at all, you know. And then and then I and then I messed them up. Um, and then sometimes the take is like the fourteenth take after we had these like incredible conversations while we were shooting. And I just loved that they could try stuff, that I could try stuff, and that none of us knew exactly what it was while we were working on it, um, which is so fun. And and. Um, yeah, they both have such incredible instincts and comedic timing, too. I, f I feel like there was so much you have to talk about when you direct in the theater that I just didn't have to talk about with these two at all. Like, sort of, like, givens about tone and nuance and thought that I feel like these two actors just, like... Right. Yeah, we didn't even have to talk about it. <laughs> and um, that was so nice, and I feel like I got a little spoiled by them. Yeah.
Well, I mean, everything's different. I mean, if you compare the theater <laughs> to cinema, you know, and I'm just wondering about some other things like um, time, you know, <laughs> just, which, which works in different ways on the stage and I think on the screen. And I'm wondering if, I think one thing this film does is capture not just like the sense memories of being a child, but also the sense of time of being of that age, so I'm and and I think your plays are also very interested in the experience of time for the viewer. So I'm wondering if you can talk about moving to cinema, time-based media. Yeah, no, I do think the experience of time passing is like the reason I make work in film and theater, and and I. But it's also so hard to articulate and talk about. So I, I'm not going to have like a super cogent answer, but but. I, I think theater is actually a much more abstract art form than people give it credit for. Like, it's very goofy and strange. And, um, yeah, there's something about being in a real room or a real forest that is just like a completely different ball game. Um, and the way you speed up time or distend time is just completely different. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of still up at night thinking about it, honestly. And so much for me was learned in the editing room with my editor, Luke, just figuring out what we had and, and what we wanted to make of it and how we wanted time to move. Um, you know, the, an, a, a f the first cut of this movie was two and a half hours long and the assembly was two hours, 45 minutes. So we cut a lot out and, and um, a lot of it was figuring out how to have a movie that did distend time and did slow down, but also kind of moved along at the pace we needed it to. Um, but yeah, I'll have a great answer for you in like 10 years about theater time versus film time. I, I really feel like you could, no one's like properly no. written the dissertation on theater time and film time. That was an excellent yeah. first step. Yeah. <laughs> but we can, um, can you talk about your collaboration with your cinematographer? Yes, and I, she couldn't be here tonight because she's giving birth in like a week to her, to a daughter. Um, uh, yes, we, she's incredible, Maria von Hauswolf, and I found her because I'd watched the movies of Klilner Palmason, um, and her work with, who's an Icelandic director, and her work with him is really amazing, and she, and I clicked immediately. Um, you sort of witnessed how oddly fused we were, and and um, we all, pretty much all of prep was the two of us driving around Massachusetts and and like lying on the grass together and staging kind of every scene together, and um, yeah, it's one of the most intuitive collaborations I've ever had with anybody. It's it, it sort of. I, sort of odd and weird and like a Bergman movie. <laughs> the two of us became became um, oddly, creepily close, I think, to sort of an annoying extent to the people around us. Um, so, um, but we talked a lot about time. We talked a lot about um, spirituality. We talked a lot about God. <laughs> I mean, she's Swedish, so these sort of like philosophical questions just came very naturally to her and both of us and and we you know we were like where is God in this scene and you it sounds better if you're speaking with a Swedish accent but you're just like where is God in this scene is he in the trees is he watching them is he you know we really were like locating different um different religions and gods in different shots and and um, there's still a couple ideas she had that were so good that we didn't get to execute because they would have been really complicated and we were on a tight schedule. Um, but and, and, and in a way, a lot of my work with her about nature and spirituality led into my work with our sound designer, Paul Shu, um, because he, I, he did something really amazing. He, he d b while we were in prep before the crew had moved in and before the porto potty had been installed and scared all the wildlife away he came to that house and put a microphone in the forest and recorded the sounds of the forest surrounding that house for 2 weeks straight 24 hours a day so we, it that's like thousands of hours of recordings and hundreds of hours of recordings <laughs> and um he that's the sound in the movie. And I feel like, in a weird way, I feel like, I don't even know if he and Maria ever met, but I feel like there were, like kind of where she ended, he 
began. And um, I do feel like when I watch the movie, a lot of, uh, a lot of God is in the sound. Yeah, I, yeah. I was going to ask you to say yeah. a bit more about the sound. I, watching the film, I had this experience for the first few minutes. That, oh, what a quiet film. Um, and then I'm, you know, a few minutes in, you're realizing just how much is going on with the soundscape and how intricate it is. And, and can you talk about just designing that? Yeah, we went a little crazy. Yeah. And and Paul um, was, we just spent a lot of time, Luke Johnston, Paul Shu and I in, at C5, working on it and pulling from these hours and hours of recordings and yeah, picking exact. I've learned a lot about the birds and frogs and bugs of Western Massachusetts. Truly, like when I go back and visit now, I'm like, that's a tufted titmouse. And you know, I, I really kind of know who's talking. and. Um, we really, every scene is, is quite painstakingly um, measured and layered. Um, and, and yeah, it was, it, it, it does feel like a big part of the movie. And, and, and there were a lot of arguments and discussions about how quiet actually is this movie. And I think Paul said it's the quietest movie he's ever worked on. And, and we had to go back and forth a lot about what's too quiet and what's... Yeah, just the right amount of quiet, which I have too in the theater. It's a difficult question. Um, we're almost out of time, but I just want to ask one question that maybe all of you can address. Uh, we're lucky to have Julianne and Zoe here, but um, it's an extraordinary cast. If you can say a little bit about casting and working with Elias and Sophie and yes, I and I felt they were in big letters on my sheet at the beginning, and then I did the thing where you skip over the people whose names are in big letters, and I forgot to say, um, all three of them are incredible, and and also weirdly the my first three choices for the parts, and they were available and able to do it, and all three such very very different actors, and and again another thing I love about film directing is just like figuring out which actors want to talk about what and how and who you leave alone and who you really get into it. Will and I like spend a really long time like picking a moonstone that his <laughs> character has in his pocket. Um, <laughs> but I don't think we ever talked about like character history. <laughs> and then Elias felt that Avi was a figment of Lacey's imagination, which, which I don't even know if I agree with, but it was such a, it was such a potent decision <laughs> that, um, <laughs> We, we just went with it and we never talked. I, I, at some point I sent him sort of a character bio over email that he never responded to. <laughs> but maybe he read it and it, it, so maybe it's in the performance. And, and then Sophie is like another theater geek. So we really, like I, I actually felt like between every take we were working on a piece of his character history or layering in kind of a different you know, with the theater scene, we did a version where the character went to Rada and then a version where the character didn't go to Rada. And um, that's the Rada version in the movie. And, and so I think she, she and I were, in a way, much more concrete um, with our dialogue together. I think partly because we've been in so many rehearsal rooms. Um, and I think with Will and Elias, it was like a little more mysterious and maybe a little more emotional. Yeah. Curious what the actors think. Do you want to say a bit about your co-stars? Um, it it was a, it was a dream. It was a dream to work with each of them, and they were so different. And it was really interesting because that's how we filmed them too. It started off with Will and then Sophie and they never Elias. Only, they, they never. Really I don't. Even, I don't. Other, yeah. I don't. Except for Sophie and Elias for that one scene. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, they just all came so, they just showed up as their characters, <laughs> particularly Elias, <laughs> who is incredible in this movie. Like, I just, um, it, it was a joy. It was so exciting to just listen and watch and see what was gonna happen on any given day. But it did feel like Zoe and Julianne and I were kind of holding down the fort and seeing who was gonna show up at the house and then they would, they stayed, they all stayed for a week and then just left. You know, it was, it kind of did feel like we all lived through the movie. These very strong, amazing personalities kind of showed up and then were gone. Yeah. And I, I didn't even get to say good, you know, there's things where you're like, oh, we didn't even get to say goodbye. They're, they're on a plane. They're now. gone. They're gone. <laughs> it's just the three of Eat us. Eat some now. chicken. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm afraid that is all the time we have for, but I want to thank all three of you for being here and for this movie.